Hello, and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson House. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our Tuesday Lunch and Learn noon Zoom message uh, for today is we're going to talk about uh, the uh, pandemic, 1918. Uh, we have a terrific guest. If we could just some housekeeping before we get started, if you could please mute your phones. Uh, Sarah Andrews is at the wheel here behind the scenes. She will dark out your screens and mute your phones uh, and your lines. And as we go through, you'll have questions. You can put them in the chat box and we will uh, be able to take them to our speaker today, Andrew Phillips. Um, I'd also like to give you some information about what's happening at the Woodrow Wilson House. We, uh, and first wanted to say thank you. Over this Thanksgiving holiday and throughout the whole year, our supporters have been extraordinarily generous and uh, very big hearted. This last weekend, we had a number of people come to see the suffrage outside. It closed over the Thanksgiving weekend. Um, and it was really tremendous to have so many people in the garden look, seeing and visiting the Woodrow Wilson House outside. We've also had a number of people sign up to do our audio walking tour of Calorama and to do our self-guided tour of the Wadi Butler Wood Houses. So this last Thanksgiving weekend was really, um, it was great for our visitors and for the house. So I thank you all for our supporters. Um, today is our last in the series of the speaker series for this fall. Um, we've had, I think this is number eight, which has really been terrific. Uh, we will take this up again starting in January. And in the new year, we will have our speaker series beyond the second and fourth Tuesday of every month at noon. So uh, we'll be sending out the agenda of the speakers that we have lined up for 2021. And we're looking forward to having you join us on uh, Tuesdays again at noon. Uh, we have offered and are asking for sponsorship for our speaker series. So if you would like to make a donation and have it go specifically to the speaker series, please let us know. It does cost us money to produce these and do the editing and put it up on our webpage. So if there's a sponsor out there who would like to help and sponsor us for the 2021 sponsor, uh, speaker series, please reach out to us. We welcome your contributions and your donations. Today is, is uh, Giving Tuesday. And so with that, I wanted to also thank you for the donations that everyone's given to the Wilson House, but also just to give you a little background um, and some updates on the house. I've been at the Wilson House for now 18 months, and this is actually really the first Giving Tuesday that I'm doing as having something that I've accomplished at the Wilson House. And I, I'm really proud of what we've done, what the team and I have done, and uh, what the advisory council and the scholars and I have done and, and the guides. Um, it's been a rather remarkable year in, in all that we've done and accomplished during COVID. And so with that, I, I say thank you to you, our supporters, um, but also want to uh, remind you that this is a day of giving. And so if you uh, will be sending out a letter to all of our supporters in the next couple of hours, and then of course, over the next month for your annual giving, and we ask you to think about us um, and, and make a donation. Um, so with that, let's get started on today's uh, talk. We have um, uh, Andrew Phillips from the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library and Museum. We brought today's uh, speaker and topic to you because although we've normally addressed the suffrage movement and we've addressed issues of race and segregation with Wilson's legacy, many of you have asked me about Wilson and the pandemic of 1918 and, and what happened during the pandemic and what was Wilson's stand and what happened. So we thought we would get one of the experts. Um, we to bring you today, Andrew Phillips. He's the curator for the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library and Museum in Wilson's birthplace of Stanton, Virginia. He previously worked in collections at the Wing Luke Asian Museum in Seattle, Washington, and the Fairfax Museum in Fairfax, Virginia. He received his bachelor's of, in history and Civil War era studies from Gettysburg College and his master's in museology from the University of Washington. A lover of museums since childhood, he remains thrilled by the opportunity to work in one every day. So with that, we welcome Andrew Phillips. 
Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here with you today, uh, to be a part uh, of this series. Um, our two sites, I suppose, kind of bookend uh, Woodrow Wilson's life. He's born down here in Stan, Virginia. Uh, he lives his last few years up in Washington, D.C. I think it's uh, more than appropriate that we get to, that we work together uh, to talk about this incredibly uh, important period in American history. Uh, there's lots of reasons to love and hate Wilson, lots of really good reasons for both. Um, and I think you're talking about the 1918 influenza pandemic, talking about the Spanish flu uh, is a great way to sort of compare and contrast in a really direct way uh, our, uh, the, uh, the history that we're living through uh, right now. I'm going to uh, darken my screen and mute it out. If anyone needs to make any questions, you can put it in the chat and uh, we'll get started with your presentation. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, as Elizabeth said, uh, if there are any questions, please feel free uh, to type them in the chat. I'll do my best to uh, address them as we go, uh, but I know we'll also have a little bit of time uh, at the end uh, where I can perhaps uh, be a little bit more in depth or if there's anything uh, I, you'd like more detail on, I can obviously uh, go back. Uh, so if you'll give me a moment to uh, share my screen so we're all looking at the same uh, images together. <clears throat> Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, I am from the uh, Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library, and we are down in Stan, Virginia. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's a smallish town in the Shenandoah Valley, sort of the northwestern part of the state. Uh, he was born here in 1856, lived here for all of about 16 months, uh, so we're milking that for all we can. Uh, but we have uh, a museum and archive as well, uh, dedicated to uh, his life and times uh, and the 1918 influenza pandemic, the Spanish flu. Uh, is definitely a, a part of that. Um, so I'll begin by just sort of talking about uh, the, the, the origins uh, of this particular uh, disease. Uh, it's, uh, as with any uh, pandemic, it's very difficult to find uh, a patient zero, uh, but the first real reported cases, uh, most historians agree, arose in the early months of 1918, uh, as early as January uh, of 1918. Uh, the pandemic rages uh, around the world until December of 1920, almost three full years. Uh, and it was caused by the H1N1 virus. That's probably fairly familiar. Uh, it is, or I should say, a strain of that same virus is what caused the swine flu pandemic uh, in 2009. So even when we talk about uh, the end of this particular pandemic, uh, know that that does not mean that the virus itself uh, went away. It remained uh, a threat, uh, and but one which was not spreading uh, at epidemic, uh, pandemic levels uh, after after the uh, the summer, or excuse me, the fall and winter of 1920. Uh, now the exact origins uh, of it uh, are unclear, uh, but historians and researchers tend to fall into two main camps, uh, and it is something just to to. Uh, be uh, just to sort of uh, start uh, by saying that it was uh, incredibly uh, important, uh, incredibly deadly, uh, and spread very quickly. Uh, and here, the image that you're looking at now is of Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, DC. Uh, this is one of their temporary influenza wards uh, that uh, you can tell uh, is on uh, essentially a porch, a veranda, that they have put a bunch of uh, beds to help the, uh, the overflow of patients. The nurse, as you can see in the foreground, is wearing a mask. A bit tough to tell, uh, I'm sure, uh, at this level, but the gentleman who's standing in the background uh, is wearing a mask as well. And each of these beds has a, uh, a patient suffering from the Spanish flu, uh, separated just by a bed sheet. They're working with what they have uh, to deal with this influx uh, of patients. But those first patients uh, for this disease uh, did not come uh, from Spain. Uh, many historians believe that it first arose with zoonotic transfer, as many diseases uh, do, and that is jumping from animal to human hosts uh, in southwestern Kansas. Uh, this place does not look uh, for, too notable, but this is Camp Funston, uh, later becomes a part of Fort Riley in southwest Kansas, and it was one of many such camps that arose across the country in the months after the United States joins World War I in April of 1917. The US had been practicing what they called preparedness uh, for uh, quite a while, uh, building up the army and navy uh, either with the intent to be ready in case we joined World War I and on the other hand to show those who were fighting that we do have a strong military and not to mess with us. Uh, 
Uh, but when the war is actually joined in April of 1917, the need for a much, much larger military uh, is immediately clear. And so camps like these uh, are built around the country to train the men before they go off uh, primarily to the battlefields uh, of Europe. And Camp Funston, uh, like these other camps, uh, has lots of men from lots of places living in very uh, close quarters, learning how to, uh, to drill, how trench warfare uh, will work, how to use their equipment. Uh, and in order to feed uh, all those men, you're going to have a lot of pigs and chickens in very close quarters uh, as well. And it is believed that this is where the very first cases jumped from human, or excuse me, from animal to human hosts. Doctors at Camp Funston in January and uh, February of 1918 start reporting a respiratory disease that isn't acting like a typical flu. Uh, it isn't especially deadly. Uh, it's spreading very quickly, though, uh, and it, re it requires a long uh, recuperation time. Uh, the men who are getting it are in the prime of life. They're very healthy, uh, but uh, they are still requiring weeks and sometimes months uh, to recover from this disease. And by March of 1918, doctors are reporting more than 500 soldiers who are too ill for duty. This does not stop the broader uh, need uh, of the US military to be shipping men to primarily the East Coast ports uh, of the US and then on to Europe. Uh, and so the disease uh, spreads, uh, so this historical theory goes, uh, from Camp Funston around the country and then ultimately uh, around the globe. Now, another main theory uh, involves a place like this, but not in uh, remote Kansas. Instead, it is a British camp in northern France, in the Pas de Calais, where in the winter of 1915 and 16, uh, doctors report another sort of strange respiratory illness. Uh, it seems uh, to, like, uh, like in Kansas, uh, be uh, spreading quickly, but importantly, in that winter, it does not really spread beyond the camp. Uh, it fades away like most flu seasons do uh, in the late winter and early spring, uh, but some historians uh, argue that perhaps this is where it first began, it uh, evolved a bit, uh, and then spread out much, much quicker. Um, there are other uh, options, uh, other theories out there, including uh, more remote places like Vietnam, uh, but uh, regardless of where this disease started, we know that it didn't start in Spain, uh, despite the name. Um, but because of wartime censorship uh, going on, not just in uh, Germany, France, but the United States, Great Britain, uh, really, and all the major players uh, participating in World War I, uh, what it means uh, is that they are making sure there is censorship of the press. Uh, they are not allowing too much information about this pandemic to spread uh, about, uh, about their home front. There's a, a number of reasons for it. One, you don't necessarily want the enemy to read in your newspapers that you and your uh, soldiers are sick. Uh, perhaps they'll see uh, your lines as more vulnerable to attack. At the same time, you don't necessarily want uh, the, the home front and even your soldiers uh, to know about a pandemic like this. Uh, it could hurt morale uh, for a number of reasons. But uh, in neutral Spain, not participating uh, in the war, and especially after this gentleman, King Alfonso XIII of Spain, gets sick, he is one of the most prominent public figures to get a severe form uh, of the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic uh, and survive. Very importantly, he does survive. Uh, it becomes uh, very well connected, especially in Western and American minds, uh, with Spain uh, because the uh, Spanish press and thus the American newspapers can be talking about what's going on in Spain uncritically without censorship. Uh, it makes it seem as if Spain is especially hard hit. And that's where uh, the name uh, comes from. It has nothing to do with where, where the uh, disease itself uh, came from. It's more a sort of a propaganda uh, item uh, almost. Now, uh, the virus comes in waves. And that first wave that I was talking about in the early months of 1918 is, uh, is acting like a typical flu. It takes a little longer to recover. It is uh, spreading more quickly. Uh, but those who are at risk in a typical flu season, though the very young, uh, the elderly, those who are immunocompromised in some way, they are the ones who are at risk in this first wave. And so there is cause for concern, uh, but uh, no uh, real drastic action uh, is taken. Uh, 
But in the fall, uh, the late summer and fall of 1918, the second wave uh, of the disease hits. Flu seasons tend to start in the late fall and peter out in the winter and spring, but this one comes roaring back uh, in the summer. And so we start seeing scenes like this one. These are Red Cross Motor Corps uh, nurses and ambulance drivers. They are all women. Uh, and they look like perhaps they're uh, behind the lines in Belgium, getting ready to head to the trenches uh, to pick up wounded soldiers. But this is a photograph from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, these, uh, these women uh, and many others like them all around the world uh, are tasked with providing battlefield style almost uh, medical care to those who either cannot make it to medical help uh, or in places that are so devastated that there is not enough medical help uh, to go around. Now, uh, when this second wave hits, it is also behaving very differently. Uh, it is no longer uh, most affecting uh, those who are uh, elderly uh, or, or the, again, the sort of typical flu season uh, sufferers. Instead, it is uh, hitting very hard uh, the younger population. Uh, in fact, in the United States from the Spanish flu, uh, more than 90% of the deaths are people under the age of 65 and about 50% of the deaths are people between the ages of 20 and 40. Uh, that age cohort that would most be expected to be able to shrug off uh, a typical flu season, uh, instead they are the ones dying in the higher numbers. Now, regardless of um, what uh, age you were when you caught this disease, uh, it tended to follow uh, a similar uh, pattern. It would begin, symptoms would begin about 48 hours after exposure. So unlike COVID, where we have this sort of 14-day uh, period where you could have it and not know, uh, if you were exposed to the Spanish flu, you would know within about 48 hours. Uh, but symptoms would begin with a sore head and fatigue, followed by a dry, often uncontrollable cough, uh, a loss of appetite, uh, stomach problems, uh, and extreme sweating uh, as well. Uh, one of the uh, more underlying uh, symptoms, one that is less uh, well seen, is that it could often trigger a cytokine storm. And this is one of the reasons that it is believed that it was so, um, uh, that it affected younger people uh, so much uh, more than uh, older folks. Uh, a cytokine storm is essentially when the uh, body's immune system overreacts. Uh, it starts uh, producing far more uh, white blood cells than are needed, uh, and they begin attacking parts of the body, cells that they are not supposed to. This can uh, significantly weaken uh, a person, uh, and that combined with things like that coughing uh, that cannot be controlled leads often to respiratory issues, especially to pneumonia. Uh, in fact, most of the folks uh, who pass away due to the Spanish flu due to uh, uh, primarily do so based on their, uh, based on uh, symptoms and uh, conditions related to pneumonia and other respiratory issues. In very serious cases, this could also result in what's called cyanosis, which is when the lungs are unable to transfer the proper amount of uh, oxygen to the blood. Uh, and then you get uh, the extremities, the fingers and toes uh, turning blue. In even more serious cases, it can result in uh, a entire person's body. Uh, turning blue from lack of oxygen uh, getting uh, around the body. This is a very serious uh, condition. Malnourishment was a bit of an indirect uh, symptom as well, but when you are having difficulty keeping food down, uh, when you are too weak to go out and get it, uh, and even in, uh, even in places where there are not as many people dying from this disease, you are still in this period of weeks and months uh, needed for recovery. And it can bring society uh, to a halt. Farmers can't be out in the fields. Uh, people can't be delivering uh, food. It's not even uh, medical attention necessarily. It's just basic necessities uh, can be hard uh, to get. And so in the, in the United States, the sharpest spike in the number of cases comes in the fall of 1918. Uh, public health officials across the country uh, recommend things that we probably find pretty familiar now. Uh, wash your hands, avoid large groups, stay inside as much as possible, uh, and wear masks. Uh, schools and theaters, uh, restaurants and bars, uh, churches and funerals uh, were closed. Uh, in some cities, <clears throat> Uh, like Seattle, Washington, and this is a colorized photograph, not a color photograph. Um, in some cities, uh, they even mandated that you could not use public transportation if you're not going to wear a mask. Uh, and this uh, photograph, we have a transit worker wearing his mask, uh, informing a maskless potential rider that no, he is not allowed to board uh, the streetcar. 
Now, unlike today, there are no federal disaster or uh, relief really agencies like what we would expect uh, nowadays. Uh, FEMA does not come around until the 1970s. There are a number of other disaster uh, and uh, sort of humanitarian relief agencies that aren't um, that don't come around until uh, the 1930s as a part of the uh, New Deal and the uh, Great Depression. Um, but very uh, importantly, uh, there is no federal response, real federal response to this pandemic. Uh, the public health officials that are employed by the federal government this time are almost entirely related to the military. They are, uh, that, is the, that is the public uh, health that they are in charge uh, of uh, protecting uh, of the soldiers and the sailors. Sometimes this can include veterans. There are a few organizations that uh, work to uh, help veterans, uh, but uh, larger civilian populations are not under their purview. Woodrow Wilson does not hold uh, press conferences uh, like those daily ones that we saw at the beginning of this pandemic. Um, to uh, talk about the dangers of the flu, to uh, talk about what could be done to curb uh, the spread of it, and no statement was ever released uh, by the White uh, House. Interesting, uh, importantly though, uh, the American public has a very different relationship with the federal government than we do today. Uh, the federal government uh, was not, did not have uh, as much of a role in daily life. Uh, when you interacted with federal employees, it was almost entirely at the post office. Uh, the uh, income tax was brand new and at this time was only, um, was only instituted on the very highest uh, levels uh, of income in the US. It had actually only been passed uh, in, earlier in the decade. Um, and so most people looked not to the federal government uh, for uh, relief, for help uh, in this time, uh, even for information. Uh, instead, they looked to city and state governments, uh, those uh, levels that did employ public health officials to deal with things like this. The result of it, though, is that there is a huge discrepancy. Uh, it's a very piecemeal approach. Uh, Boston reacts differently than Atlanta, reacts differently than Chicago, reacts differently than Seattle, reacts differently than LA. Uh, and so some cities deal with it better, uh, some deal with it worse. Um, and perhaps the best way to look at it is to compare uh, two specific cities, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, and Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. St. Louis's uh, public health officials uh, institute a, a broad uh, a series of measures to as soon as they hear about local cases within two days of the first cases being reported in their area. Uh, this included bans on large gatherings, uh, uh, closing schools, theaters, restaurants, bars. Uh, they also stated that even things like funerals uh, could only be attended by 10, no more than 10 adults uh, and no children, um, as well as things like masks uh, when you're in public. Philadelphia ultimately uh, institutes those same measures, uh, closing the same sort of places, uh, but they very importantly wait two full weeks before, after the first cases are reported. And even more importantly, in that interim two, in, in that uh, two week period, they allow a massive parade to go forward through downtown Philadelphia. Some 200,000 people uh, come into the city or fill the streets of downtown for a uh, parade specifically to raise funds for the war, for the war bonds drive. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, when after you're exposed to the Spanish flu, you tend to uh, have symptoms within about 48 hours. And so it's perhaps not surprisingly that the absolute peak uh, of the disease in Philadelphia of new cases being reported comes 48 hours after that parade. Philadelphia will ultimately be the hardest hit of any large American city. Uh, with more than 16,000 deaths from a half a million cases in a city of about a little under 2 million people. St. Louis, uh, by, uh, by contrast, would have a peak mortality rate of only about an eighth that of Philadelphia. Because there is this strange uh, piecemeal approach uh, to this public health uh, issue, it means that it, by early 1919, when the disease is not at its peak, but still very much uh, a concern and a threat, in some places you will still have, like in this image, uh, mask mandates for public transit, and in others uh, you would see baseball games uh, going on. Uh, there, there is some precaution taken. You can see the batter uh, is wearing a mask, 
I'm not sure if the catcher or the umpire are. They might have one under their protective masks. Um, the crowd largely, uh, uh, it's a bit tough to see in this image, but the crowd, uh, those in the crowd are mostly wearing masks as well. But there were places that were locked down and there were places where you could go uh, to a baseball game. The, uh, the US government, the federal government is absolutely impacted. They are aware uh, of what's going on, uh, but the reactions they have to it are largely uh, on a micro level and not uh, trying to help uh, the country at large. Uh, the US Congress, for instance, continues to meet, uh, but the galleries uh, were closed uh, to visitors. Uh, the, uh, the White House staff, uh, some of the members of the White House staff do catch uh, in the fall of 1918, the flu, uh, though it seems that Woodrow Wilson and his wife Edith uh, managed uh, to avoid uh, catching it themselves. 1918 was also an election year, uh, like what we're uh, in right now. Uh, the difference or a difference being uh, that it was an off year election. So it was just Congress, a third of the Senate, uh, and of course state races up and down the ticket, but no uh, president uh, on the ballot. Um, but in the 19 teens around this time, this is before television, largely before radio, uh, politics uh, and campaigning were done in two main ways, through the newspapers and through uh, in-person uh, rallies. Uh, and especially for larger either statewide or national uh, candidates, uh, those rallies were often done with surrogates. So it wasn't the candidate themselves showing up in every place. Uh, it was uh, surrogates speaking at these rallies, uh, uh, extolling the benefits, uh, the, the, uh, the qualities of the candidate of, uh, that they chose. But because of the restrictions placed uh, in many cities, uh, in many states around the country, uh, you lost that ability to gather lots of people in large public rallies. And in a letter to Woodrow Wilson from Homer Cummings, who, had the, who was the vice chairman of the Democratic National Committee, the Democratic Party, uh, Homer Cummings wrote, the speaking campaign was very largely abandoned on account of the influenza. This made it necessary to devise alternative methods of publicity. And I think that in this regard, we have been somewhat ingenious and really effective. Every possible agency of publicity open to us has been employed. The great number of interviews from prominent men all over the country which have found their way into the public press have been in a large measure due to the activities of the, com of the committee. Trying to take credit for how many times they were able to get interviews in the paper uh, for, uh, for their candidates. But despite these uh, ingenious uh, and effective uh, methods, voter turnout is down significantly uh, in the 1918 election. Uh, there, uh, and, and the Democrats, Woodrow Wilson's party, uh, is largely uh, washed out. Uh, they lose uh, a number of seats uh, up and down the ticket. And many people didn't go to the polls uh, because they were sick, again, long uh, recovery times, uh, or because they were afraid of getting sick. Um, and uh, as A. Scott Berg wrote in his biography uh, of Wilson, those who took their chances in voting found many of their fellow citizens wearing face masks. Um, this is a, a, a time, again, when the federal government is not really responding. The Wilson, uh, Wilson himself and uh, the larger federal government believe that their main role is prosecuting the war, uh, prosecuting World War I, uh, and, and leaving public health decisions to public health officials lower down, uh, lower down the chain. What this means is that there is a definite need for larger organizations, uh, NGOs, to step in in a, uh, in a not just local uh, role. And the Red Cross, the American Red Cross, is an excellent example of that. Uh, and one of the ways that they respond uh, and try to help communities uh, during this pandemic is by creating temporary hospitals, uh, including uh, this one in New Orleans. Uh, this is the Sophie Gumbel house. Uh, Sophie Gumbel was a very wealthy uh, uh, woman living in uh, New Orleans. She had died in 1916, uh, so not related uh, to the pandemic. Uh, but in her will, she had said that she wanted her mansion to be turned into a school. Uh, the, the process of turning it into a school had not yet been completed uh, by the time uh, the pandemic hits in 1918. And so the Red Cross raised about $30,000 and worked with the trustees of this, uh, this soon to be school uh, to turn it into a temporary hospital. And New Orleans certainly needed it. Philadelphia was the hardest hit followed by Pittsburgh and uh, New Orleans was the third uh, hardest hit large city uh, in the United States. Uh, and again, even in areas where there is a low mortality rate, life is largely grinding to a halt uh, because so many people uh, are getting sick and needing so much time uh, to recover. 
Now, of course, uh, this pandemic is not only happening uh, in the United States. Uh, this is an image of an influenza ward uh, in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, primarily British and American servicemen. Um, and uh, just because uh, there's a pandemic going on, the war did, certainly did not stop just because uh, of that. Uh, there is, uh, because of the, the, the war itself, it becomes even more difficult to pin down a, a total mortality uh, figure for this disease. Um, it's, it's difficult even in the best uh, of circumstances. Uh, uh, those who are uh, affected uh, by, who actually uh, are sick with uh, COVID-19 uh, are not the only ones suffering uh, during uh, this, our own uh, current pandemic. Uh, and when there is also a global war, and not just one. Uh, World War I is, of course, raging uh, around the globe. The Russian Civil War is in full swing. There is, uh, there's a war going on in South America that has nothing to do uh, with World War I at this time, too. Um, and there are numerous other smaller conflicts uh, as well. And so it becomes very difficult to pin down a, a, uh, a death toll specifically due to the uh, pandemic. And so historians have ranged from 17 million dead to 50 million, and some have even gone as far as to say 100 million people uh, died due to the 1918 influenza pandemic around the world. This is out of a worldwide population of about 1.8 billion, less than a third uh, of the current uh, world population. Historians also estimate that around 500 million or a quarter of the world's population caught the disease at one time uh, or another. Uh, in the United States, uh, it's a little bit easier uh, because we, uh, while we are fighting in the war, uh, there is no uh, actual fighting really being done uh, on American soil. And so historians estimate that around 675,000 Americans uh, die to, due to this disease, 50 million or so contracted it, and that's uh, out of a national population of about 100 million. So half of the US population at one point or another caught uh, this disease. This is, of course, uh, an estimate, uh, and I can speak uh, for uh, Virginia, the state of Virginia, about 16,000 deaths, the same as just Philadelphia, uh, are, are attributed to uh, the pandemic, uh, but that is only based upon death certificates of those who have uh, the uh, disease listed as a cause of death. Uh, there are numerous folks uh, in especially the western and southwestern parts of the state, more rural parts of the state, who couldn't necessarily get the help, the medical help that they may have needed, uh, passed away without, uh, without uh, knowing if they had this disease or not telling, uh, you know, the, uh, the medical person putting together their uh, death certificate uh, that they had it. And so that 16,000 is almost certainly low. And one of the reasons that the death toll worldwide is so high. Uh, it is certainly, uh, the death toll is certainly exacerbated by these global uh, conflicts. Uh, it spreads rapidly in trenches and in refugee camps. Um, and so it becomes uh, difficult to say if the uh, disease and malnourishment uh, of a family uh, who is living in Ukraine during the Russian Civil War, uh, do they uh, have uh, members of their family pass away because of this disease? Is it because they are unable uh, to get basic supplies uh, because of the fighting? Uh, it, it becomes uh, difficult to pin down. Now, there are a few places around the world that are able to escape the flu entirely uh, and, and several others that are less hard hit uh, due to, uh, due to uh, strict quarantine, primarily uh, procedures being put in place. Uh, and one of them is the territory of American Samoa, uh, led by this gentleman, uh, Governor um, John Martin Poyer. Uh, American Samoa, uh, a couple of uh, islands in the South Central Pacific, uh, the broader Samoan islands had been divided between the uh, Americans uh, and Germans in 1899. Uh, not surprisingly, I'm sure uh, there were no uh, Samoan signatures uh, on that peace treaty that divided the islands. Um, but by the time of the World War I and by the time of the pandemic, uh, America still has uh, its uh, islands, uh, the Eastern Samoan Islands, while Western Samoa, which had been a German colony, had been taken uh, by the Entente and at this point has a New Zealand, uh, a, a, a governor who is from uh, New Zealand, appointed by New Zealand. When he hears of the uh, pandemic ra uh, raging around the world, uh, Governor Poyer makes a very unpopular decision to completely cut off his uh, territory from the outside world. Uh, no travel in or out. 
Uh, this is uh, very unpopular, not only within uh, the territory, but also uh, with uh, those outside of it. And he is heavily criticized by his, uh, uh, his New Zealand appointed counterpart in Western, uh, formerly German uh, Samoa. But the results speak for themselves. Uh, American Samoa uh, records no, zero casualties due to the uh, Spanish flu, while 22% of the population of Western Samoa will, will die, will pass away uh, due to this disease. French New Caledonia, uh, an, another island colony in the uh, southwestern uh, Pacific uh, between what's now Papua New Guinea and Australia, uh, similarly isolates itself and escapes. Uh, and Japan, you'll probably notice uh, an island theme here. Uh, Japan uh, will ultimately not be able to avoid it entirely, but reports a mortality rate of only 0.4%, uh, very low, uh, one of the lowest uh, in the in sort of developed uh, world. Uh, and this is attributed to very severe restrictions that were placed on travel uh, to the home islands, to the home archipelago uh, of Japan. Uh, this, of course, is a time before there is air travel. If you're getting to any of these islands, uh, you're going by sea, uh, and it's uh, much easier to uh, quarantine yourself in that fashion than it is a more porous uh, land border. Now, as I mentioned before, the war uh, certainly does not stop just because of this pandemic. Uh, and in November of 1918, uh, an armistice uh, is declared and negotiations over the peace uh, begin uh, in earnest. Uh, in late 1918, in December, uh, Woodrow Wilson travels to Europe. He is the first U.S. president to do so uh, while in office uh, and meets with uh, the other, here we have him pictured with the other big four. I'm sure this is a, a photograph you've seen before uh, with the leaders of the United Kingdom, Italy, and France uh, as the main power players uh, at the Paris Peace Conference that ultimately produces the Treaty of Versailles, the Treaty of Sèvres, and the other three as well. Uh, but it is while meeting with some of these gentlemen pictured here on April 3rd, 1919, that Wilson is forced to excuse himself because he is feeling very ill. And as the diary of his doctor reports, he staggered to his room. Wilson had been having a very severe headache all that morning, uh, had been sort of uh, muddling through as, as any out there with migraines uh, know, sometimes you just kind of have to do. Uh, and, um, but uh, after lunch, uh, he resumes a meeting with some of these other big four leaders and just cannot, yeah, begins coughing and cannot stop. And so he uh, uh, excuses himself and returns to his room. His doctor, uh, Admiral Kerry T. Grayson, uh, pictured here, uh, is a, uh, truly, uh, Im a truly important uh, historical source because he was a confidant uh, and friend of Wilson's all through the presidency. And while in Paris, he recognized his sort of fly on the wall status. He wasn't a part of the negotiations himself, but he was often in the room. And so he uh, makes a diary, uh, starts uh, recording a diary uh, that is uh, an incredibly important uh, historical resource. And if you're interested, uh, the Woodrow Wilson uh, Presidential Library has it all transcribed and searchable even uh, on our website uh, if you're interested in reading uh, for yourself. But his diary records that on April 3rd, 1919, uh, he is called to the president's room and finds Wilson with severe pain in his head and back, a 103 degree fever, uh, an uncontrollable cough. Uh, and as well, he was severely upset in his equatorial zone, which was the po uh, poetic way that the great, uh, Dr. Grayson was saying that the president uh, had diarrhea. <laughs> um, Wilson has Grayson report that he only has a severe cold. Uh, though Grayson in his diary uh, 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 privately diagnoses that Wilson has influenza. Uh, the, uh, this has led uh, a number uh, of scholars uh, to uh, conclude that Wilson had the Spanish flu uh, in April uh, of 1919. But importantly, uh, Wilson is only confined to his bedroom for about four and a half days. Uh, he's in bed for two of them, and then for the, la the next three, uh, the next two and a half, I guess, uh, he is having meetings uh, in his sort of sitting room. He's still being comfortable and, and trying to take it easy uh, on doctor's orders, uh, but uh, he is not uh, in bed. And within a week, he is back uh, in the meeting rooms. Wilson is 63, uh, so he is not in the... Uh, the, he is not in that 20 to 40 range that is most at risk, uh, it seems, from this disease. Uh, but medical, uh, modern medical analysis and historians have called this influenza diagnosis uh, and this idea that it was the Spanish flu into question. Uh, Wilson didn't have typical symptoms. He had some overlapping symptoms, 
uh, with the Spanish flu, but there was no outbreak of the flu in Paris uh, at the time that Wilson caught it. Uh, and very importantly as well, his symptoms went away in a few days, uh, which was uh, very rare. John Milton Cooper, who is the author of the Pulitzer Prize finalist biography of Woodrow Wilson wrote, uh, it was almost certainly not the notorious Spanish flu of the pandemic that had raged worldwide, but his fatigued condition now made him susceptible to a different strain. Um, ultimately, uh, Wilson uh, recovers uh, from uh, this disease. Uh, the, uh, a number of the, or as you should say, the, the peace treaties uh, are signed in the summer of 1919, uh, and World War I is officially brought uh, to an end. But now that the war is officially over, that still doesn't mean that the pandemic is. Um, and as American troops moved into areas of Germany as an occupation force, they found that the Spanish flu was still very much a threat. Uh, and this photograph is from a gymnasium in Luxembourg that has been uh, requisitioned uh, as a temporary hospital uh, for American servicemen. Uh, you can see they're sleeping head to foot. Uh, they are uh, largely wearing masks, um, even the ones who are asleep. Uh, Luxembourg, very small country sandwiched between France and Germany. The Germans had taken it very early in World War I um, without much of a fight. I mean, you know, tiny country versus a massive empire, uh, not too surprising. Um, but it meant that their infrastructure was largely intact. And so uh, there were a number of places, this was well behind the, away from the occupation zone that was deemed safe for uh, American hospitals uh, like this one to help the soldiers who were recovering. Now the pandemic uh, is declared over in December of 1920. Uh, and uh, to be fair, it had been declared over uh, before. In fact, uh, the British had said that it was over in August of 1918. Uh, but this time it really did seem uh, to be done. Uh, because the speed of transportation was so, is so different uh, than today, uh, it hits different places around the world at different times. Um, and really it only ends, uh, not because there is a vaccine, uh, but because so many people had caught it that there was a herd immunity. Uh, and it stopped being a pandemic when it, didn't, when it no longer could sort of rage uh, virgin field, uh, as it were, uh, through populations who had no immunity to it, uh, in the same way that, uh, that uh, smallpox and other diseases uh, uh, raged through uh, the Americas uh, after, uh, after the 1490s. The, uh, it lasts almost three years. Um, and like I uh, said at the top, uh, it's caused by the H1N1 virus, and that virus is still very much around. Um, it is, it is not, th has not threatened the world the way it did in between 1918 and 1920, uh, but, uh, remains, uh, but remains out there and, and is something that people continue uh, to study and to research. The 1918 influenza and COVID-19 uh, are not the same, despite both having 19s in them, I guess, uh, but uh, there is a lot we can learn. Uh, certainly, uh, from this last time that the United States really uh, battled a, a pandemic at this scale. Uh, and uh, there's much we can take, uh, I think, from history uh, that will be, that is uh, important to understanding uh, our, our, current, uh, our current moment. Um, I see that I, I've, I've got uh, a couple of questions. So I'll, I'll uh, well, before I get to the questions, I'll say once more that uh, I truly appreciate uh, the President Woodrow Wilson House uh, having me uh, here today. I hope this has been uh, an interesting topic. Certainly not a uh, especially fun one, um, but uh, certainly I think uh, more than relevant, especially when we're talking about uh, Woodrow Wilson. Thank you, Andrew. Um, if you don't have the screen up, I can start with some of the questions. The one of that came yeah, up. Yeah, like I was having a little bit of a trouble, but yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Thank um, you. The f you say that there are three main major cities that were struck: Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and New Orleans. You mentioned that Philadelphia had the parade, but why were the? What's the reason that these three cities topped the list? Um, yeah, well, I, I will say that it's not, those were the three worst hit. Uh, lots and lots of cities. Uh, are, are hit by it, uh, to be sure. Um, I th it, it's primarily a question of how quickly they responded. Um, uh, St. Louis does it in two days, Philadelphia lasts two weeks, and then they have the parade that really makes it worse. Um, the, the same, the Pittsburgh, New Orleans, they're not having, they don't have these massive uh, crowd events, uh, but they still are slow uh, to react. Uh, to put into place these sort of closures and quarantine sort of lockdown uh, measures. Uh, and so they, uh, they, um, they, uh, they just, uh, 
fare worse uh, than some others. Uh, and, and I won't, uh, I don't want to give St. Louis even a pass uh, too much. They react quickly, but they also uh, reopen a little too quickly. In fact, St. Louis will lock down three separate times because they've reopened too quickly the first two times. Um, so there are, I mean, there are significant casualties even when, when, some, when a city uh, reacts quickly. Uh, but uh, yeah, it does seem like Philadelphia with that, that parade being the, the main catalyst uh, is, is the worst off. So with your, if you put your historian's hat on and your expertise in this, what would you say precisely are the things that you mentioned that we can learn from today? Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, one, we, we are in a much better position because we have a, uh, virology is now a well-established uh, scientific discipline, which that wasn't really true uh, in, in the 19-teens. Um, but I think, I think uh, what we can learn is that the, uh, the places that do better react quickly uh, and they try to be, um, what's the phrase? Uh, they are not selective in how they apply it. Uh, St. Louis uh, seems to have done well because they said no large gatherings, no school, no theaters, all at the same time. Uh, Philadelphia, uh, another part of it is they do all these things, uh, but like for a little while they said, okay, but the bars can stay open. Okay, no, now we're going to close the bars. So it was, it was, it was even that sort of uh, trying to do it step by step as if we could, we could find the magic amount of things to close before it would be fine. Um, and uh, uh, ultimately that didn't work out uh, too well uh, back then anyway. So there's a similarity then between uh, having it done state by state today uh, mm -hmm. and having it done state by state or city by city a hundred years ago. Uh, what do you think we have learned from that? I mean, there are now organizations that are able to help. There is now, um, I, I, won't, I won't be, Political, but there, I mean, there has been uh, there has been the especially early on that effort uh, of to have the federal government be an overall coordinator, um, uh, and maybe that could have been done better or worse. Uh, I think I think an important uh, thing that we learned from uh, the Spanish flu is that the the federal government, Woodrow Wilson, the president, not having any role in it was not a good idea. Uh, there at, at no uh, if nothing else, he could have been a very powerful mouthpiece to be communicating these, this is what we know and this is what we could be doing, um, as, as opposed to saying, well, uh, Albuquerque can deal with Albuquerque and, uh, you know, Phoenix can deal with Phoenix and Chicago can deal with Chicago and that sort of thing. Did they have a Fauci of their day? They did not. There was a, the, the highest up, uh, I don't remember, I don't have his name uh, offhand, but the highest up uh, medical professional in the federal government at the time was the head of, uh, of a department of the U.S. Navy that was primarily responsible for uh, veterans homes. Um, and so, uh, as well as sort of uh, medical care uh, within the Navy. But I mean, even then, it was a very specific, um, a very, uh, uh, he had, even even that gentleman had a very limited scope in what was expected of him, and, and what was not really expected to to step into a national uh, medical role. Um, a question came in, and uh, so are there any images of Congress members or staff at the White House that had uh, that were in masks? Any deaths in those groups? Not that I'm aware. Um, I'm they, they, it's entirely possible. I have never seen any. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the, there are uh, White House staff who get ill, but they are, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's domestic staff, and so they just go home. Mm -hmm. um, the, they're able to at least per, um, to uh, protect the first family. Um, uh, Woodrow and Edith uh, don't catch it, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not aware of any of any. Uh, of, of masked Congress uh, photos. I certainly have uh, as good as, if, if there was a picture of Wilson in a mask, I would definitely have used it uh, in this program. It uh, doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I, I have not come across it. Okay, so what about the sheep? I've read somewhere that the sheep, it, it, they put it in the newspaper that the sheep got the flu. <laughs> uh, there was, there was the, the sheep did get uh, sick. Uh, our education director is probably better to answer that than I am. I don't think it's the same disease. Um, I think it's they 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 have a, a sheep 
a sheep illness. A sheep illness, okay. <laughs> um, for those of you on the call that there was a notice in the news that, that there was a historically a notice in the newspaper that said yes the sheep on the white house lawn have come sick with uh, influenza so it's a little tongue-in-cheek tongue in sheep uh, <laughs> so how did um <clears throat> How did Hoyer, uh, can we talk a little bit about uh, Hoyer and um, Samoa? Mm -hmm. Their question there was the safety of the of this island versus really the finances. Do we have any feedback or any um, uh, any historical context of how they did uh, financially as an island after their complete shutdown? Well, this is a, uh, a much less uh, globalized uh, world. Um, the uh, Poyer is a governor appointed by the Navy. He hasn't been elected uh, by anyone. And so he is there in a military capacity more so than anything else, uh, really. Um, and that is his concern. Um, I mean, the, the, the people of uh, Samoa are still uh, are not uh, reliant on really food imports uh, too much. Um, there is business going on. There is trade going on. But you know they're they're able to fish uh, just fine, uh, and so it is inconvenient, but not uh, devastating to the people. Um, the uh, uh, Poyer is acting in a military capacity uh, and thinking as as a military uh, officer, uh, and to protect what he's in charge of, he closes it off. And um, I don't, I don't, there wasn't, uh, as for the, like the way it recovers, I mean, it recovers okay in that nobody, nobody died, uh, because of this disease as again, it was like one in five, uh, in, on the other, the neighboring islands. Um, and, and like with any place that is arbitrarily, uh, divided, uh, by Western powers, there were plenty of people who had family in other islands who would like to have visited them. And so this is a, uh, one of the reasons that it was, uh, controversial and, um, uh, criticized within Samoa, American Samoa, and without. Uh, but uh, Poyer is not responsive to, uh, doesn't have to be too responsive to those uh, needs, those demands, because again, he's appointed by the Navy. He's not elected by anybody. Um, so I, he, he's there in a different capacity than what we might expect uh, uh, nowadays. So speaking of those powers, were there any other of the big four that got sick? Uh, any other kings or presidents of other countries that got sick other than the King of Spain? Uh, there are a couple. Um, the, the other, the big four do not. Um, they are, or certainly not while they're in Paris. Uh, that's one of the reasons that it's believed that Wilson has Grayson say that it's just a cold and not something that could have been much more serious. Um, he, this is in the midst of significantly tense negotiations, primarily with France, about France demanding uh, a lot from Germany and Wilson not wanting to make Germany pay that much. Uh, and so he doesn't want, uh, uh, he doesn't want Clemenceau, the, the French leader, to think that uh, he's weak and therefore that the American position is weak. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons we, we think that he tells, he tells Grayson what his, he tells his doctor what his diagnosis should be. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of the other big four leaders getting sick around that time, though. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is that Lloyd George had it, but not during Paris, not in Paris. Right. Exactly. Yes, not during Paris, yes. Uh, but uh, then the other question is, were there scandals or questions whether this is just propaganda? The, the flu? Yes. Um, hmm. not, that, not that I'm aware of. I'm sure, I mean, I'm, I'm, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, I have not, I've not come across that. As a comparison to today in that there's it is not some... compared to today, certainly not compared to today. The, I don't, the, the, uh, there was, there was a uh, backlash against some of these, uh, closing, uh, procedures. Um, but, uh, this was, this, it was not politicized the way it was today, uh, the way this, uh, this is today. Um, and there's also, uh, uh, it was it was more people being upset that the bars were closed um, or or that they couldn't go to a wedding, um, but there wasn't like there weren't uh, heavily Republican states that were doing things and heavily Democratic states that weren't. Um, there was there was a uh, there was a recognition across the country that it was it was serious, and also this was not the first time there had been a not as serious pandemic, uh, but it was called the Asiatic or the Russian flu about thirty years prior, and so this was not entirely foreign. Uh, it wasn't a hundred years since the last big one for us. It was only, you know, 
a generation. Um, and so I think that probably played a role uh, in the response to this disease. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, we, ha we had some questions come in and I just wanted to make everyone note that these recordings will all be available on our YouTube channel after the fact. So uh, if you have a friend that misses today's discussion, don't worry, we'll be putting it up uh, as a, along with this suffrage speaker series and all the speak all the speakers that we've had over the last uh, nine months, we'll have them online as well for you. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and that is, uh, can you tell us a little bit what's happening at the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library and Museum? Uh, absolutely. Um, so we are uh, doing virtual programs like like y'all are. Uh, we do our uh, history at home programs every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. Uh, um, if you're interested today, I'm doing one in, I guess, ooh, in an hour uh, about Dr. Grayson, about uh, his background and uh, where he comes in. And I, I just want to stress how important a source he is, uh, especially when we're talking about Wilson's sickness in uh, in April of 1919, I, there was, a, there was a, a note in the chat that um, was saying that people don't think that was real. Um, he was sick. Uh, he was sick a couple of times. We think actually late in April, early May of 1919, he also had possibly a mini stroke, which, which uh, uh, affected him uh, significantly, even uh, in the lead up to that massive stroke he will have in October of 1919. Right. Uh, but... Um, this, it was uh, Dr. Grayson's uh, very important historical source for a lot of this. Uh, and so I'll be talking about him uh, too. Uh, and then on uh, Fridays at 2 p.m. we do a sort of rotating uh, series uh, of programs, uh, not this Friday, but the next I'll be talking about Wilson and slavery, talking about the enslaved people who lived and worked here at his birthplace. Uh, that's a piece of the Wilson picture that most people don't know. Um, uh, and then another one about uh, segregation uh, the week after. But uh, yeah, we're doing a lot. We're doing live uh, virtual programs, and they're all free, and you can see them on our website, WoodrowWilson.org. Great. Well, um, yes. Uh, just to thank you very much for for letting us know about all the wonderful things that you're doing down at the museum. Uh, for our visitors online today, it's not that far to take a trip down to Stanton, and for those of you in Stanton, it's not too far to come up to to Woodrow Wilson House in Washington D.C. We did have a comment um, that yes, it was reported that Woodrow Wilson was very ill in Paris uh, with the flu during the Paris Peace Conference, but there is little of evidence of this. Uh, it was written in my memoir by Edith Wilson. And she makes no mention of the flu or the illness. So uh, yes, I, I saw that comment. I, I absolutely disagree with that. I, 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 I agree that uh, uh, Edith doesn't make much of it, uh, doesn't mention it in her memoir. Uh, I think one of the reasons that uh, historians today don't believe that it was the Spanish flu is that Wilson is sick a lot. He is, especially at this period of his life, he is not an especially, he's never an especially hale or hearty gentleman. Um, but by this time in his life, uh, he, uh, he is not overall well. Um, so so uh, yeah, I, I disagree with the, the, the idea that there is little evidence of it. There's a lot of evidence of it. I'd be happy to point to actual letters and diary entries and things. Well, we're gonna have to make a trip down to Stanton to do some research then. Definitely. Yes. Great. Well, with that, I say thank you to, it's just the top of the hour. Thank you to all of our, uh, to our Andrew Phillips, our speaker today. And thank you to the Woodrow Wilson uh, Library and Museum for having him join us today. I appreciate that. And thank you to our viewers. And of course, for all of you for your contributions and your donations and your support of the Woodrow Wilson House. Uh, today is Giving Tuesday. So um, I wanna thank you in advance. I know you'll be uh, reading our letters and thinking about the Woodrow Wilson House for your donations for the year end. Uh, with that, we will see you. You'll get some information about what we're up to in 2021 and uh, wishing you all a safe and happy, happy and healthy holiday season. Thanks. <laughs>